Yeah, so today I'll be talking about from Catastrophe to Chaos in Production. I'm super excited to be here for y'all to be joining us um, and obviously to follow my co-author. So uh, I'm Kelly Shortridge. I'm VP Product Management, Product Strategy Capsulate. We're a startup based in New York City uh, that provides infrastructure monitoring detection specifically for production environments. Obviously, I'm also co-author of the Riley Report on Security Chaos Engineering along with Aaron. So what are we going to be talking about today and why is it important? Uh, so I think probably everyone on the call understands the importance of production systems, but ultimately it's where we can actually realize value from all of the software engineering and development that we actually conduct. So I think it's safe to say across all industries, I think as Andreessen said, like software is eating the world, every industry to a certain extent is starting to become like a software delivery um, sort of company. Uh, so I think it makes sense that we should probably keep these systems safe, right? Especially failure can feel like extra scary if it's in some sort of like production service that's customer facing, um, because if there's some sort of failure there, it can lead to uh, directly missed revenue, it can lead to refunded credits, obviously more abstract and less quantifiable things like uh, loss of reputation or loss of trust among your customer base. The thing is, though, that failure doesn't actually have to end in disaster. Failure can actually be wielded as a tool to ensure our systems can handle incidents gracefully and that we can recover quickly and smoothly, which I think is what we all want. So today, the real question is, how can we harness failure as this learning opportunity to make production safer? The answer, at least we think, is security chaos engineering. So first, I'll cover failure in production, and then we'll move pretty swiftly to a bite-sized little intro on security chaos engineering production with some examples. Let's start by talking about failure in general and also specifically how it manifests in production. Defenders tend to think in components uh, while attackers actually think in systems. This is a recent hot take of mine inspired by the SolarWinds breach and that could definitely be its own talk or the paper. Uh, but for now, I think what's important or really important to understand is that this component focused mindset means that you actually miss the bigger picture about how failure happens in a complex system. Each individual component could actually seem like secure on its own, but the way they interrelate actually isn't. So what does that mean in practice? Um, I'll actually be tying component versus system level thinking to failure, um, borrowing from uh, Martin Kleppman, who wrote Designing Data Intensive Applications, which is great um, to bring this discussion. The component versus system level thinking with failure basically faults are at the component level, while failure is actually at the systems level. Faults are things that can go wrong in a component within a system. So as Klepman pretty wisely stated, um, we can't make a system tolerant of every possible kind of fault. I would say some security teams seem like they would try to do that, but it's really to their detriment. I think there's also a really example, or a funny example that he gives in the book of like, if we tried to make um, our systems fault tolerant to like a black hole swallowing the earth, um, you'd have to have space-based uh, web hosting, which I think it's pretty unlikely that any sort of company would do that. Maybe Elon Musk, but like, who knows, right? Failure, in contrast, is when the system as a whole stops providing the required service to users. And that definition, definition is obviously very like software-centric, but in general, you can think of failures when a system isn't operating as intended. So faults can cause failures, and there are often multiple faults that conspire into a single failure. Really important to understand is you will never, ever, ever, not at like the heat death of the universe, like at no point will you be able to eliminate the chance of faults in your systems. This is just the reality of complex systems. Despite this reality, unfortunately, we see a lot of focus, particularly among InfoSec teams, on preventing potential faults or issues in production, like removing vulnerabilities before deploying software into prod. Probably a lot of you are engineers yourselves or programmers yourselves, and you um, have felt the frustration of trying to, kind of like Aaron said, like the whack-a-mole ahead of uh, releasing some sort of code. Obviously, these kind of activities, they can be somewhat useful, but it's really, really unrealistic to assume that all potential faults can be preemptively mitigated. This is especially true in things like container runtimes or orchestrators or the underlying kernel itself when you actually don't have control over those components. So some examples of this, like a container can have all of its vulnerabilities patched, but a misconfiguration in an orchestrator, like an allowing anonymous access, can give a, an attacker full control over it and actually all, control over all of the containers in the cluster. Another example is you can scan all your code, like reflecting looking at the security of a particular component, but then your attacker can waltz in, do recon on your systems, think in that system's perspective. 
then they'll realize that, oh, actually your code scanning tools have read and write access to all of your repos. So there's no need for an attacker to target a specific part of your code base or exploit a vuln in one component when they can compromise the code scanner itself, and then gain read write access to all of your code base. Again, it's that component versus system level. The final example to really like drive this point home at the component level, you can think of like, oh, what actually creates and stores your code is maybe like GitHub. But there are actually other parts of your system that interact with your code base, like an automation server, say Jenkins. So you can have YubiKeys and other two-factor auth on GitHub with strict procedures about who can push code to your repos, but then you don't have the same on your build server. So attackers can gain anonymous access to say like Jenkins script console and execute commands resulting in a big system level failure. As you can see, this is why it's so essential to think at the systems level rather than the component level, because that's where faults actually become incidents. Now, ultimately, failure in production manifests in this kind of mess of multiplicitous manners. Part of the difficulty of keeping all of this production infrastructure safe and operational and why like, we're talking about it today is the breadth of infrastructure itself. You can have infra hosted on-prem or in private or public clouds. It can have, you can have physical servers, virtual private servers, virtual machines, containers, functions. Those can be running customer-facing services or operational services like automation, configuration, management, orchestration, and so forth. And this is ultimately why we have to approach production environments like the complex systems that they are. They're full of interrelated components that affect each other. You can think of failure like a tapestry of interwoven strands that can spread fire to the rest of the tapestry. And this creates the risk of contagion, which can transform an event or fault in one component into this kind of poison that seeps into other components and severely disrupts your services. Another layer of complexity is just that there's kind of this like busying array of activity that can jeopardize production operations. I think there are two key types um, that you can really think about as far as this activity. There's deliberately malicious that would generally be conducted by attackers. And then there's what I like to call accidentally careless, often by like, developers. So for instance, attackers can spawn an interactive shell, disable SD Linux, exploit a memory mismanagement vulnerability to get root. Then they can learn a, load a kernel module in order to gain persistence. Developers, on the other hand, could be accidentally careless just trying to do their work. They can download production data or accidentally delete log files. Oftentimes, this activity actually overlaps and looks pretty similar. So attackers and internal developers alike, even the very well-meaning ones, can both be inclined to attach a debugger to a production system. The unfortunate thing is that can still uh, facilitate informational uh, information exposure, privilege escalation, even if the intentions are good. I think also just to preempt to this, you sometimes hear about like insider threat or like the rogue developer. But if your failure modes already are including attackers that have privileged or admin credentials, you're covering those potential threats anyway. Because a rogue sysadmin and an attacker basically going to look the same as far as like system behavior. Another thing to keep in mind when we think about how failure manifests in production is that most production infrastructure runs on Linux in one way or another, and basically everything is a file on Linux, right? This means failure in production often bubbles up from unwanted file-related activity. It is certainly not the only way, but it can kind of be helpful for getting our understanding and navigating like what experiments we should conduct. So let's look at some examples of like how um, these files and faults in production can manifest as failures. So for instance, um, if your log files are deleted or tampered with, like log pipelines are critical for operational and security monitoring and workflows. So I think, um, most of you probably in the audience would understand like your day is just screwed if you discover that this has happened, right? Um, neither SREs nor SecOps is going to be very pleased about this. It's really terrible. Another example, like um, it changes to um, like SSGH keys, like root certificate stores, boot files, like all of these are critical assets. So if you modify them, it's a serious risk to stability. This is especially true if it's due to an attacker maintaining access or otherwise rummaging around in the system. Another one is resource limits being disabled is generally like very suspicious and also almost assuredly disastrous. Um, you know, whether it's due to like an infinite script or a crypto miner that's just like devouring your compute, if your resource limits are disabled, it can lead to like seriously uh, overloaded overhead in your system and that can result in service disruption. So all of these things I think are like definitely not stops, right? So when we're confronted with all of this complexity and this like myriad of potential things that can go wrong, how do we constructively cope with this? We cope with this by replacing catastrophe with chaos. 
This brings us to talking a little bit about security chaos engineering. So in the same vein as Aaron, um, I'm going to assume that you're going to download the report, which is free, um, and that you're at least a little familiar with chaos engineering. So we're just going to dive right into more of a TLDR on the subject. So whether we're talking about system faults from a dev and ops perspective or from the security perspective, our goal is ultimately to prevent faults from spiraling into failures as much as we can and to be able to respond to failures as elegantly as we can. The purposefully triggering fault actually lets you realize and test your success towards that goal. And this is ultimately the practical magic that's offered by security chaos engineering. The TLDR on uh, security chaos engineering, which I'll call like SC SCE alternatively, is that it seeks to leverage failures as a learning opportunity and a chance to build knowledge of systems level dynamics towards continually improving our systems resilience. Obviously, we're at a report with Aaron on this, um, so check it out if you want a deeper dive. Two of the key benefits I want to highlight here, though, of uh, SCE are that you can generate evidence from experiments that helps increase your knowledge of how your systems behave and respond to failure. Another super important benefit, um, as Aaron mentioned, like instant response kind of sucks a lot of the time, is that SE helps you actually build muscle memory around responding to failure. So incidents become problems with known processes for solving them. You can kind of think of it like the goal in a, in a way is to make incident response like almost boring because it feels routine after repeated practice. So your incident response or like cert teams get training uh, and that way they aren't panicking during incidents or scrambling. Burnout is like a real and terrible problem. And I think we all wish like it didn't happen um, in incident response work. So if we can minimize it, like we should seize the chance to do so. Another key benefit of SEE is that um, identifying the relationships between components and production actually helps reduce the potential for contagion during incidents. That helps you recover service faster. If you're tracking a metric like uh, mean time to restore or recover, this is gonna be extra important to you. The performing uh, security chaos experimentation can facilitate this kind of discovery of this, um, these interrelations. So simulating a fault in one resource can exhibit which of the other resources connected to it are also impacted and then how it can foment in failure. You want to practically understand your production systems and how they respond to certain failure conditions. You really have no choice but to conduct chaos tests in production because that's the only true signal of that. Um, the reality is just that if you don't run your tests in prod, you won't be as prepared when the inevitable incidents there do occur. But it's also pretty reasonable that if you're starting out kind of on your SCE journey, um, your organization and particularly maybe like your boss or your boss's boss would be reticent to start, um, you know, SEC, uh, SCE experiments in production, like injecting failure, like are we sure we want that, right? So staging environments can be used to conduct experiments first. You can gain an approximation for your, how your systems respond to failure. And um, you can eventually get more comfortable with the process itself and start uh, making sure you're conducting, conducting your experiments in prod. So really view like operating and staging as more of a stopgap. Again, the report goes into a bit more detail on that front. This brings us to what kind of SCE, SCE experiments should you actually try? So which experiments you prioritize are likely pretty dependent on your organization and your industry and just what you're building. So in the report, Aaron wrote about how to start small with experiments and build confidence in the process. And I also talked about how to prioritize assets based on both attacker value and organizational value in the context of threat modeling with decision trees. But you can also use this matrix that's on the slide um, for thinking about which resources, if they're part of an incident, would actually impact your organization the most, which means you should probably build confidence in your ability to respond to failure there first. So for instance, a revenue generating service um, is almost obviously an area that you should probably want a lot of confidence in your ability to respond to failure in it. But maybe seeing how your internal like business intelligence systems fails isn't so important um, as far as thinking about what's most important to your business, or as I have on the um, in the chart, like your Slack Moji database, like that goes down, who cares, right? Probably don't want to start your experiments there. Now let's explore a few examples from the report. We actually break it out by um, experiments for kind of the build phase and then also the production phase. So these are drawing out five examples from uh, the production phase experiments. So the first example, um, you can create and execute a new file in a container. So in the wild, um, an attacker can compromise a container and attempt to install and run a backdoor by creating and executing a new file in it. Whether the compromising data, running a crypto miner, or otherwise, as I put it, like yeeting around in a container, this fault can easily result in a broader system failure. 
the great thing about this experiment is it helps you answer questions like, is your container actually immutable? How does your container respond to new file executions? Does it affect your cluster? How far does it actually propagate? Are you containing the impact? And of course, how quickly is the activity actually detected? The second example, injecting program crashes. Um, obviously, program crashes can happen just due to bugs, like not security bugs, um, and can definitely be just a fault that directly leads to failure. But attackers can also cause program crashes when they attempt to exploit, say, like a memory corruption vulnerability. So this one helps you answer questions like, is your node restarting by itself after a program crash? How quickly are you able to redeploy after a crash? Does it affect service delivery? And are you able to detect a program crash in prod? The third one, disabling resource limits like CPU, file descriptors, memory restarts, and so forth. As part of executing crypto miners, attack attackers will sometimes disable these resource limits so they can gobble up CPUs towards mining their coin, which is generally Monero, not Doja coin. So this answers some questions like, can an infinite script take up resources? Is there an automatic process for restoring resource limits? Does any resulting uh, slowdown in response times lead to issues in other services? Are you able to take the system offline and reintroduce a new version with resource limits enabled without impacting your operations? And obviously, are you detecting when they're actually disabled? Fourth example, uh, I think everyone's like least favorite is uh, disabling access to DNS. There's that infamous haiku, it's not DNS. There's no way it's DNS, and then it was DNS. So you know, DNS is really like such core infrastructure that everyone assumes just kind of like works. So when it doesn't, your world comes crashing down. This experiment, you can answer questions like, how reliant are your systems on external DNS? Are you able to detect a potential DNS attack? Are you caching entries? Do you have a fallback in Etsy hosts? Are you generating alerts if DNS entry points are pointing to potentially malicious IP addresses? So this is actually my favorite one. Uh, this is time traveling on a host. So this involves changing the host time forward or backward. Um, probably many of you who are SREs or other system operators in the audience will likely know all too well, time is not always on your side when it comes to distributed systems. So this answers questions like, how are your systems handling expired and dated certificates or licenses? Are your systems even checking certs? Do time-related issues disrupt or otherwise fork your service delivery? Are you relying on external NTP? And are time-related issues like across logging certificates, SLA tracking, and so forth, generating alerts? In conclusion, failure is inevitable, so you might as well turn it into a strength by learning from it early and often. And importantly, you want to remember to optimize for minimizing the potential of faults fueling failures. Conducting experiments uncovers new knowledge and helps build that muscle memory. I think we all want to avoid firefighting, coil, and burnout that incident response could cause. The security chaos and engineering helps build confidence in the safety production systems and your ability to respond to them. I think this is something that the whole organization can kind of like vibe with, not just InfoSec. And as you'll see in the report, um, we firmly believe that engineering teams outside of security can adopt this as well or bundle it with the rest of your chaos engineering experiments. So I would like to close with a quote. Um, and this one seems by Buck Paul and Yuck seems like definitely apropos for chaos testing, which is our real discoveries come from chaos, from going to the place that looks wrong and foolish and stupid. That, again, this was only a surface dive into security chaos engineering. So check out the report that uh, Aaron and I wrote, available for the lovely price of free. So you can download it today at that link. That, thanks y'all so much.